In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her. Mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen, and I bought, like, food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed. The nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator, and who had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. This is a memory that I have about my family going to the hospital in which I was about to be born. I recently started thinking about this memory again for some reason. It's just something that I cannot find a logical explanation for, considering that I'm a hyper-skeptical guy. The memory is seeing my dad and other family members walking their way out of my grandma's house, where we used to live, to see my mom give birth my birth at the hospital. I can perfectly recall how my dad was dressed that day. For the rest of my family, it's kind of a blurred image. My dad was wearing a black blazer and blue tie with pink diagonal stripes, black jeans, and a lighter blue shirt. I remember even how he was walking while smiling, a pretty detailed and vivid sequence of images. So, as expected, a couple of years ago, I might have been 20 at the time, I'm 28 now, I was going to tell him about this weird memory. But before that, I decided to ask him first about how he was dressed the day of my birth, to make sure he didn't just go along with the memory to fool me. And yes, you guessed it, it was the exact same way that I remember. He said he perfectly remembers since he planned it beforehand what he was going to wear for the day of my birth. I freaked out so hard. I would ask myself how this is even possible. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started trying to figure this all out, and I came up with a theory. I later dismissed it, but my family used to record my cousins and I all the time in childhood with this old camera and then put them on VHS tapes. So I started thinking that maybe an uncle of mine or someone else had recorded that moment of my family on the way to the hospital. So I decided to go over all the tapes that I had, plus it's fun watching them. But no, I didn't find anything even remotely close to that image that I had in my mind. Plus, after re-watching my life series on these tapes, I realized they started recording after I turned one year old. So, yeah, one-year-old me tapes were the oldest tapes made, nothing before that. Another thing that I realized, the way that I remember this scene of my family couldn't be recorded in this weird angle and perspective. It was like I was looking at them walking, but also being careful to not be seen, kind of hiding a little bit behind a wall. Kind of an odd way to record something, right? 
So that's my story about this weird yet accurate and vivid memory that I have before I was even born. I'm still trying to make sense out of it. Every time I start thinking about it, I can't stop until I sleep. In 2016, my girlfriend and I decided to go on our first vacation together. We booked a three-night stay at the Belmont Hotel, not its real name, which was a historic hotel in the old part of the city we were in. It was an elegant manor-style home from the 1850s, and parts of the property looked from that period. Massive staircases, a parlor room, and original furniture throughout. Our first day, we did the usual touristy stuff. Exhausted, we settled into our room and crashed for the evening. Our first night, we barely slept. My girlfriend and I were both uncomfortable sleeping in the room, and we felt like somebody was watching us. A few hours later, at about 3 a.m., we were abruptly awoken to a very loud sound coming from above our room. It sounded like somebody was pulling or pushing a large piece of furniture, that stuttering of wood on wood and the creaking. It was unbearably loud. This went on ad nauseum for a while. We were totally awake, thinking that somebody was working upstairs, like a staff member moving furniture or rearranging the room. We were both dumbfounded, sitting upright in our beds waiting for this to end. The second day, more touristy stuff. We didn't really think much about the previous night. The second night, we were zonked out and ready to sleep early. This night was strangely similar. We woke up around the same time to the exact same creaking and stuttering of furniture or something being moved around above us. It eventually stopped like the day before and we managed to fall back asleep. The next thing I remember is my girlfriend waking me up abruptly saying, what are you doing? I awoke standing in the middle of the room in the dark, unpacking my bag angrily and throwing our clothes into the air. I snapped at her for asking me what I was doing and for interrupting me. I was frustrated and agitated upon waking. Suddenly, I vaguely remembered what I was doing, almost like a dream upon waking when you try to hang on to that dream. I sat on the bed and I explained that I was looking for a key in the room, and I remembered wandering around the room desperately, searching the walls, the floors, the furniture with my hands in the dark. I was getting more disturbed the more I explained this to my girlfriend. The idea that I was alone in this dark hotel room doing this really frightened me because I had no control. Needless to say, we decided to call it early and head home and end our vacation. We drove the full four hour drive home that night in pitch darkness and fog. I called the hotel that morning to check out early. Speaking with the front desk, I mentioned the loud noises coming from above our room. She replied, There is no room above yours. It's an attic space, and no staff would have been in there at that time. I mentioned that it sounded like somebody was dragging furniture on hardwood. She said that there was a lot of furniture up there, but that no staff member would have been there. I asked her if the hotel was haunted, and after a moment, she responded reluctantly, that she's not sure, but she has heard other similar stories. This happened just a couple of years ago. I went to Ireland to study for a couple of weeks, there, I met this large group of people from my same country. I didn't know anyone. One boy caught my attention among all of them. In the exact same moment I saw him, I thought, I've already seen him. He just seemed so familiar. I approached him and we started talking. I didn't mention to him that he looked familiar. I found out that he lives really far from my city, 
in a region I have never visited, and that he has never visited my region either. I also found out he arrived in Ireland after me, so there was no way for me to see him at the airport or anything like that. Then, after some time chatting, he said, Have we already met? I was thinking you look really familiar. That really freaked me out. We never figured out how it was possible to feel like we had met each other before, because we certainly never had. And to this day, it just feels like such a glitch in the matrix kind of experience. I don't really know how to explain it. Reading some posts about glitch in the matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about 10 years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawleys because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing through the veil type of thing. But could it be a glitch in the matrix after all? Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes, row your boat, hickory dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead. The book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the Golden City to join the Angel Band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learnt from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learnt the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again, just Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as it was supposed to. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. 
The first-person narrator uses a Brett Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker, and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc. part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me. And I turned to my partner and said, You know, I don't care what anyone else says, I love this song. And she said, Yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station newsagents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says, that's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers. And if you Google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliche. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way. But it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. This occurred about three years ago. I had a position as a buyer, and as such, would receive tons of cold calls and emails from people trying to get our company to try their products for resale. Also important, our company had a digital phone system, like VoIP. There was one central number, and it followed a phone tree to multiple offices via internet connection. Voicemails were available on our big office phones, but the recording would also be sent to our emails. So one day, I received a voicemail from a phone number I recognized as someone who had been attempting to get a hold of me to sell me their products. Oddly, the voicemail was something like 15 minutes long. Curious, I began to listen to it. The message begins with just static, and the sound of rustling. Seems like a classic butt dial, or maybe they forgot to hang up when the voicemail clicked on. I fast forwarded the message, just to see if anything was ever heard. And yes. Suddenly a clear voice. They're having a one-sided conversation. I think, ooh, these can be fun sometimes. Except, the one-sided conversation is clearly with me. The person on the phone is referencing my then-recent maternity leave, our company by name, a few other pretty identifying details that currently escape me. They'd stop speaking, and it would be blank air, and then they would answer a pertinent question that I would have asked in that kind of a conversation, clearly speaking to me. But I never spoke to this company or this person. I did receive additional emails from them later that were clearly initial attempts at communication and not a follow-up conversation. I checked with coworkers in case somehow, somewhere, their conversation got picked up in my voicemail. And nope, coworkers and husband were equally confused. But with zero explanation, we all just had to move on. I was about 15 years old when this happened. It happened in school, which was in Ireland. In my school, we had compulsory subjects that we had to take, such as math, English, etc. 
We were able to pick two option subjects. I chose technology, kind of like woodworking but with circuits as well, and art. My best friend of like 12 years and I got put into the same technology class. Now, to be honest, all we ever did in that class was mess around. We never completed our projects, and instead we would just burn stuff and do stupid things. Anyway, each table was square, and one person was sat at each edge, and beside each person, connected to the desk, was a mechanical vice. It's basically something that you could tighten to hold something in place. My friend and I would literally put anything in there and just squish the crap out of it. One day, we had a piece of copper wire. It was quite thick, I'd like to say a centimeter in width, and it was probably like eight or nine centimeters long. We placed it in the vise and started twisting the knob and tightening it on the wire. When the vise fully closed, we opened it to see what would have happened to the wire. However, when we opened it, it was gone, and I mean like fully vanished. We started to look under the table, in the vice, around other tables, even behind our teacher's desk. After looking everywhere, we thought maybe we dropped it and somebody picked it up. We had like eight others in our class, so we just asked them if they had picked up a copper wire. And of course they replied, no, didn't you just squish it? Or no, I didn't see anything. Now, I want to emphasize, that my friend and I spent at least an hour looking for this wire, and we tested another wire in the vise to see if that would vanish, but instead it just fell on the floor when the vise was opened. We just laughed it off and said that it's probably some kind of interdimensional thing, but we've really been puzzled about what happened ever since. On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and coworkers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear. Cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is or how that stuff got into my trunk. Bye.
I was around 24 years old at the time of this event. I have always had trouble sleeping, and I would sleep during the day most of the time. This particular day, I woke up way later than usual. And once I did, I was really confused because it was already dark outside. I started wondering what had happened to my mother because she never takes her keys with her. I'm the one who opens the door for her when she gets back from work at the end of the day, so I wondered why she wasn't home yet. I was about to grab my phone and call her when I realized some of the lights from our hallway were on. For a second I thought I was dealing with an intruder or something, but I heard my mom's voice right away. How did she get inside? How come I never heard the door? I got up to make sure it was really her, and it was. When I asked her how she had gotten inside, she got really mad at me, asking if I was crazy, and told me that I was the one who had opened the door for her. I asked her how the workday was and went straight back to my room after. I never opened that door. I was sleeping. So who the hell opened it for her? The door was locked from the inside. Yes, I've already considered sleepwalking, but I've never had it, and no one has ever seen me doing it. And I think my mom would have noticed if I was sleepwalking as opposed to just opening the door as usual. To this day, I know that somebody, who apparently looked like me, opened that door, but I never did. Let me start by saying that before this sequence of events, I was 100% a non-believer of the paranormal. I'm still in shock of what I witnessed yesterday. But I'll tell you the whole thing from the beginning. One month ago, in my apartment building, some weird noises started. It was like somebody was doing construction work on their flat. I didn't pay much attention. I figured somebody could be repairing stuff or something of that sort. It started on a Friday, and it was almost always in the afternoon, ending at like 2 or 3 in the morning. The weekend, the same thing. The morning was quiet, and then the rest of the day busy with a noise that was like somebody hammering or something. Everyone that was on the right side of the building, my side, was starting to get annoyed, mostly because everybody wanted to rest, to be able to work the next day. Of course, we started to try to find the location of the source, to pin this down to some singular apartment. There's also another building close to ours where the walls connect. I've gone to every apartment and put my ear near the lock, and there's almost no sound. The flat most affected is my upper neighbor, where she lives with her daughter. We thought maybe it could be the apartment above her making all this noise, even though the water supply is shut down, same with electricity so logically nobody should be living there. But we had to be 100% sure. So we called the owner and asked her kindly to open the apartment so we could check to see if somebody was using it or had forced an entrance. No one was there, and the noise could be heard. It was coming from the apartment under where my neighbor above lives, so we ruled out that the inhabited apartment was the source. Time goes by and this phenomenon repeats every single day without missing bangs on the walls, bangs on every division of the apartment of my neighbor, on the furniture, things falling in the bathroom and the kitchen. Police were called three times, but of course they couldn't find anything. They entered this flat and they also heard the noise, but they couldn't pinpoint where the sound was coming from. It also travels very fast, from the kitchen to the living room, etc. Also, in the corridor on the first floor, we started to bang on the wooden walls, and we would get replies from this unknown source. We would even ask questions, saying knock once for yes, knock twice for no, and we would get replies. Fast forward, and finally both my neighbor and her daughter went away for the weekend. Magically, the sound stopped. I didn't know this until yesterday. I just thought, finally the noise went away. They returned yesterday. And guess what also returned? That's right, the knocking again. So I was in the corridor with both of my upper neighbors and another from the same corridor chatting. Both she and her daughter were outside the flat. 
her daughter was playing with the other girl, the other neighbor's granddaughter. And by this time, there were no noises. We were all just chilling. But later on, her daughter went inside to pick a doll to play with. We started hearing the knocks again. Every single time her daughter went inside, we would hear, after about three to five seconds, the knocking. So I asked my neighbor, can I go inside? And she replies, yes, of course. I went inside, full silence. I stood there for like 30 seconds, nothing. I came out and I asked my neighbor if she could go inside as well. She goes inside, zero knocks. We ask her daughter if she can go inside again, and boom, knocking all over the place. I kid you not, this didn't miss, and we did this like 10 or 12 times. And every single time the daughter went inside, the knocking would start. Later on, other neighbors arrived on the corridor. We did the same process, and when the neighbors went inside, there were no noises. But when the daughter went in, full-blown knocks. I honestly don't know how to deal with or solve this situation. But after what I've witnessed, I'm 100% sure that this is something of the paranormal. I just don't know what. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. And I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair, standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side, next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued. 
until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped, the pets stopped acting weird, and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid twenties and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017, whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. 
We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019, I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, Hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never set foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there. Stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, We're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer, since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, Surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before, when I heard him say we were low on milk, and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. 
My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and was a bad boy, while I was popular and in all honors and college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed, until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and teased that it would never happen, so that's why I mention this. In 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend to or understand the hiding of medications, thus leaving large amounts of all kinds of drugs just lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas in 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing the extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman that he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time, I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think that it's Josh playing practical jokes, something he was well known for. But this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase, separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn, with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of the yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying that her father would navigate my loss and that he would keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told him he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing by my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, which was tiny, and that was it, other than the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex spray paint that we were using. I told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him or whatever, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. 
So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth. And I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but I decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything, until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights, because that's how I was raised. I would go to bed, and at some point, I'd open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover that I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I would lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate came home, I'd get up to greet her, only to find that I was still entirely alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this very clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaned up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while I was living there, but never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and got up to look. The pages had stopped flipping on the song, Hey You, and when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized that if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone in the other direction, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night I had been out with a friend until around two o'clock in the morning. When I opened my door, I stepped in and I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, Oh, hi, Pink. And I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. That's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but I never did. And actually, I never really talked to them at all. To answer some questions you might have, 
My roommate and I were and still are really good friends. We never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I typically don't tell people this, because they usually don't believe me, and I would rather not go through with the ridicule and name-calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was a male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until judgment day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in Southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house mama don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it. And both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our Pitt Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back to the pond, barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. 
Thanks, Popper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast, and how I had ended up in the center of the pond, since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me, and after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there, staring at her, with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two, and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. 
I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery. Because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might have been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal but it's really hard to tell what happened. I 
Last Thursday, in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything, food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. I was working a part-time job at a church at the time of this event, and it was at the end of the day, so I was cleaning up and getting ready to lock it up for the day. For context, this church is very old, and there are graves on the property that date from the 1860s. The place has burned down twice. I go to the church's kitchen to grab my lunch bag from the fridge, and when I walk through the door, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman at the counter to my right. I thought it was my boss, but the fridge was straight ahead, so I walked forward and grabbed my stuff. I turned around, and there was no one there. I was alone in the kitchen, and the door didn't open, but there was someone there. I made a conscious effort not to look, because I'm kind of socially awkward. I thought about it and realized, wait, that woman was wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern on it. How on earth could that have been my boss? She only ever wears jeans and sweaters. I kind of freaked out, and I went inside and locked up the church. And I told my friend about it who's been going to the church for a long time. I didn't tell him what she was wearing, just that I had seen a woman that I didn't recognize. He told me that people like to joke about the church being haunted, but that there was no way I saw a ghost in broad daylight like that. It was the light, playing tricks on me. Sure. After my job was done, I forgot all about the interaction. Until I got a text. From my friend. It said, Bro, was that woman you saw working at the counter wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern? I never described the clothing to him. So we both saw the same woman in the kitchen cooking. Our theory is that back in the day, the women would do all the work in the kitchen for church services. She must have been buried on the church grounds and she was just there, working in the kitchen for decades or even a century, continuing on with the work she had always done. To start off, 
I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching, was six to seven feet tall, and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So I go get my Gatorade, cause ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst, and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did and he handed me another smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911 and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, 
back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room, or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out, saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home. And I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? but I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. 
When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled, and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside. He's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're going to stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place. It's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit. This is something my grandma told me. It was summer in the late 70s. My grandpa was stationed in California while my grandma, mom, and uncle were living in Oklahoma. My grandma and great-grandpa decided to take a trip with the kids to visit my grandpa in California. They made it there safely and had a really good time while they were there. The morning they left, my great-grandpa called my great-grandma back in Oklahoma to let her know they were about to hit the road. It was about a three-day drive, taking the scenic route and stopping to sleep at rest stops. It was a normal trip, my mom and her younger brother playing in the back seat. They had made it to New Mexico and were only about eight hours away from home, when they were suddenly hit by a freak blizzard. They could barely see where they were going, so they were driving slowly and looking for somewhere safe to pull over and wait out the storm. They saw a bunch of lights on the road coming toward them, and assuming it was emergency vehicles, they pulled over to the side of the road to let them pass. The next thing they know, an officer tapped on their window, waking them all up and asking them to move along. They were confused, but just kind of brushed it off, thinking maybe they had just decided to sleep where they were rather than continue driving through the blizzard. Except, when they started to look around, there was no snow. There was no sign whatsoever of any storm. They stopped at a gas station, and my grandma said something to the attendant about the storm. He didn't say anything, but looked at her like she was nuts. They got back on the road and were home that evening. When they got home, my great-grandma was in a full panic, asking them what the hell happened to them. Apparently, it had been ten days since my great-grandpa called to say they were heading home. They all have an entire week of their life missing, and they have no idea what happened to them, or where they were during that week. It's currently 12.03 a.m. and I'm still processing what happened today. I was home with just my nephew, who was taking a shower, so nobody could have opened the door. A little backstory. My dog Ziggy and I were outside so he could take care of business. When he was done, we came back in. As we're coming inside, my nephew is pulling up. He comes in and gets in the shower. I come into my bedroom, leaving Ziggy in the living room. I walk up to my bedroom window, 
and I see Ziggy running from the china berry tree in the yard to the corner of the house. Instantly tripping, I run from the bedroom to the front door, which is right by my bedroom. I open the door and call for him. As I'm calling his name, my nephew opens the bathroom door. He's right here, he says. Now when I tell you my mind was warped, I mean it was gone. I stood there for five minutes, staring. I didn't know what to think. He was literally just running in the yard two seconds ago. How the hell did that happen? I was so confused. Has this happened to anybody else? Last night, I went to pick up my dog from my dad's house, and something really weird happened. It was around 10 p.m., and I picked up my dog. I've driven from my dad's house at night a thousand times, and I know the road back like the back of my hand. He lives on a ranch, and to get back to the freeway, you have to turn left when the road forks. So I'm driving to the end of this road, but the fork never comes. I keep driving on and on and on, but the road isn't ending. After a good 10 minutes, and note that this road is rather short and should have only taken me about 2 minutes, the road finally forks. I make a left, and on the side of the road I see glowing eyes, like cat eyes. Then the road just ends into a big ditch. This road should have led to the freeway. I turned around and started driving back, when all of a sudden, a dog jumps on the side of my car. This thing is growling and snarling at the window. This is gonna sound lame, but it's the truth. I got chills and a really bad feeling of dread, and I'm like 90% sure that that was not a dog. I slowed down, panicking, because I thought I was going to accidentally hit this dog. I love dogs, even demonic ones, but then it just disappears. I looked around the car with my flashlight, and this thing was just gone. I floored it out of there and turned back onto what I thought was the main road, and kept driving. I got the GPS to navigate back to my house, and it said that I was a little less than 10 miles away from the freeway. This is literally impossible, because the road that my dad lives on is not that long nor does it lead to any other road that long. I was so panicked that I floored it home, and I forgot to expand the map to see where the heck I was. Once I got home and calmed down, I went on Google Earth to try to see where I went, and it doesn't exist. There's not a single road that long, nor anything that resembles what I saw anywhere in that area. I have no clue what happened and my friend and I are convinced that I traveled into an alternate universe for a little bit last night, that the cat that turned into the dog was a skinwalker. Whatever else, we don't really know. I'm not sure if this is a numerical glitch or just an uncanny coincidence. This story isn't anywhere near as interesting or eerie as some of the stuff I've seen and heard. It might be one of those guess you had to be there stories. But this rather strange thing happened to me and I strongly feel like it was either a glitch or a synchronicity of some sort, and I've always wanted to tell this story. When I was in my early teens, I always liked the numbers 2549. They were just my favorite numbers, specifically those four, specifically in that order. I don't know why, but I always felt like they rolled off the tongue, and being a dumbass kid, I'd go around saying, 2549, 2549. If I needed a password for something, it was 2549. When my parents let me choose their lottery numbers, it was 2549. My brother would always tell me to shut up and that nobody cared about my favorite numbers and that they weren't cool or significant in any way. I knew that. 
I just liked them. Fast forward to me turning 14. I got my first cell phone. My parents were very strict. I never had a phone as a child. Anyway, I'm really bad with technology. So I asked my tech savvy brother to help me with setting it up and with SIM activation and whatnot. A few minutes after fiddling around, he looks at me in disbelief. He goes, Lainey, have you seen your cell phone number? I hadn't even looked at it, let alone tried to memorize it. So I was like, no, why do you ask? He was like, come over here and have a look. I swear that the last four digits of my cell phone number were 2549, in that order. My favorite four numbers in the correct order just happened to be the last four digits of my first cell phone number, a randomly generated number that nobody had picked. My brother's the only one who understands the strangeness of it because he had heard me harp on about those numbers our entire childhood. We both just stared at it and then laughed at how coincidental it all was. To this day, my phone number is still the same, and I always chuckle to myself when I give people my number, because I still enjoy saying the numbers out loud, just as I did when I was a kid. Life is weird. A friend of mine worked in a hospital. She called me up one day to talk about strange things that were happening. She worked night security, and during this time, an older part of the hospital was being renovated. She would notice things, like the sound of someone walking behind her, equipment being moved around, the doors opening and closing, doors to patient rooms would jerk open, she was getting scared and asked me to come with her one night. I got permission to walk with her. I saw the doors open and close, and I even heard someone talking in one of the patient rooms. This side of the hospital was closed off. She, I, and one other security guard were the only people there that night. I took a ton of photos and videos. On one of the videos, you can hear footsteps, and on one video, you could see a door creak open a bit, all on its own. All of that was all right, but this scared the hell out of me. During one of the videos, I could plainly see a figure of a woman walk out from a room. She stood next to the nurse's desk. It was very quick. I was moving my phone from side to side. I didn't see her with my naked eyes, so I didn't know to pause. She had a bluish tint to her. She had a jacket, a skirt, and kind of a beehive hairdo, and glasses. My friend showed the picture to some of the nurses. A few of the older nurses said it looked like a girl who used to work there, and also died at the hospital. One nurse jumped up. Oh my gosh, that looks just like Maggie. She said that Maggie worked in the hospital in the early 70s and died there from cancer. I wish I still had the pictures and the videos, but my phone was stolen before I could upload them. But my phone was stolen before I could get all the footage off. Either way, it was a pretty terrifying experience, but kind of cool too. Everything that will be written here is true. It could be misinterpreted, but I'll explain everything as it is. I'm 21. When the events that I will tell you here happened, I was around 15 or 16. I was fascinated by abandoned buildings at that time, and the first one that I found that was close to my house was an abandoned hospital. This hospital was firstly built in the early 1900s as a sanatorium, then was bought in the late 1980s by the regional hospital to become a palliative care center. My first visit was the one that started all of the curiosity that I had about this place. In the beginning of the summer, 
I came to this three-floor hospital. Our first goal was to take pictures of this beautifully decayed place. Everything was fine, until we arrived on the third floor. My friend suddenly started to panic, and, being a bit aggressive, yelled, Let me go out! Let me go out! I first thought that he was doing a joke, but he looked really scared of something. Since I didn't want to leave, I accompanied my friend outside, and then came back inside, alone. I wanted to take pictures of the empty corridors of the third floor. The weird thing is that when I asked him about this a few minutes later, he didn't remember being aggressive or scared. All he knew was that we went outside together, and I went back in. I didn't have any particular feeling about the place during the visit. I was just excited, because it was my first time in an abandoned building. My second visit was with a different friend. I didn't tell her anything that happened during the last visit. Like the last time, things started to become weird when we arrived on the third floor. I started to feel a little bad, like something was preventing me from breathing correctly. My friend told me a few minutes later that she was having the same weird feeling. We felt scared and didn't want to continue with this oppressive sensation so we left. The third time, I went to the hospital with a camcorder. I probably did the worst thing ever. Before our second visit together, we watched some paranormal videos on YouTube, and we wanted to get some answers about the third floor. During the whole visit, we asked some questions to the supposed entities that lived in the hospital. We got what we interpreted as an answer in the basement. Since our last visit, things were moved and destroyed, probably by vandals. I asked, did you move anything here? On the video, I could clearly hear, it's not us. The other voice that I recorded was in the church part of the sanatorium. It happened just at the moment we were leaving, a voice whispering, it's the death. The last thing we did this day was to go to one room of the third floor and ask multiple questions and wait for answers while recording everything with a voice recorder, trying to get EVPs. After a few minutes, we saw a shadow moving really fast, and we heard what sounded like heavy footsteps running on broken glass just behind us in the dead end corridor. I immediately ran to the direction of the noise. My friend and I looked everywhere in the hospital, but nobody was there. We ran out and left the area, promising that we would not try to get in contact with those entities again. The following night, I had sleep paralysis, and I don't often experience that. There was a black silhouette staring at me in front of my bed. This might have been a coincidence, but it was quite weird that it happened just after this scary episode. After all those experiences, I returned to the hospital alone after that, a few times actually. Sometimes I didn't have any bad feeling in any part of the hospital and was able to capture every picture that I wanted. Some other times, I had the feeling that I was not welcomed, was oppressed, and didn't have the courage to take the pictures that I had initially planned. As I told you, I was 15 or 16 when all of this happened. Now the building is sold and under security. If I had the same experience today, my judgment about the events would probably be different. My theory is the following. The voices we heard on the recordings were probably interpreted because we wanted them to be there. My friend's behavior in the third floor could have just been a strong case of panic. The bad feeling that I had on this floor might be because of the memories of my friend's reaction. My friend having the same feeling that I did is a little weirder. I first thought about something in the air like asbestos, dust, or cracked paint, maybe even mold. But this theory doesn't work, as it was not happening every time I went there. 
The noises of the person running on cracked glass is still impossible for me to explain. Where did this person or animal go if it was one? All the rooms were opened. The noise was behind us in a dead-end corridor. We saw nobody running, and the noise only lasted a few seconds. What was that shadow behind us then? It wasn't ours. The sleep paralysis that I had after that, maybe it was just sleep paralysis. But maybe it was more. What do you think? Do you think that we encountered something that day? So, my friends and I visited this abandoned place in Slovakia. The asylum was first opened in 1918 as a spa center. Later, it was rebuilt as an asylum and closed in the 1970s. It is said that patients were tortured here, and many experiments were done on them. So I took a lot of pictures and recorded about 15 minutes of videos. We've experienced strange sounds. Something made a lot of noise, but we didn't make anything of it at first. After the noise, we said, do that again if you're here, but nothing happened. But then as we were leaving, something made a noise behind me, and my friend said he could feel a cold touch on his back. So we finally left the place and looked at the photos. There's something on the photos that I need to debunk, or not. I enhanced the photos already, so you can see better. The links will be in the description. I'd love to hear your opinions about them. I don't know what we saw, but I'd love to debunk it or confirm what it is. Today, my mom told me a story that happened in December of 2019. She works at a hospital. I found her story quite unsettling. Just for backstory, I'm from Catalonia, Spain. My mom is a doctor who works in a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illnesses and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition. No gas leaks or anything like that. So her story went like this. She has a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographies done. Everything goes on as usual, and when they're done, my mom goes to an adjacent room's computer, room N4, where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her. No more than 30 seconds later, she hears the doorknob turning violently, as if somebody is desperately trying to enter the room. At first she thought it was her friend, so she yelled, Come in! Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiations piercing through. The knob just kept turning. They were shaking it as well, so she yelled again, Come on in! She thought how rude it was of them to act like this. It was then when she realized her friend couldn't be there, as she was putting her clothes back on, and there was no way she already had. She explicitly told me that she had the feeling that nobody would be behind the door when she opened it, so that was it. She quickly opened it, and sure enough, nobody was there. There have been a couple more incidents around that room too. For example, one night there were two doctors with my mom, when suddenly one of her co-workers witnessed an ecography gel bottle flying at extreme speeds against a wall. There was nobody there, just the three of them. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit too cliche-like, maybe because I'm not experienced, but I can assure you that she didn't make this up. One of her coworkers says that there's something wrong with that floor as well. I really don't know what to think.
This is just a little story in case anybody is interested. I work in a medical lab in a series of hospitals, and lately I have been working in one that has a senior's home attached. One wing is for seniors who are in their right minds and just can't look after themselves anymore, wheelchair bound, things like that. The other wing is for seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Usually when I drive into work, at least once a month, the flag out front is at half mast, meaning that one of the seniors has passed away. The medical lab in this hospital has a small waiting area outside, and the rooms in the lab are in an L shape. The smaller part is the blood collection room, and the longer is the actual lab with the machinery and so on. The door leading from the collection room to the lab is at the junction of where the long side and short side of the L meet, and this is also the entrance from the waiting room to the collection room. I hope you're not confused, but it's the best way I know how to describe it. One morning, I was working by myself. The other tech was out doing x-rays. And as I stepped from the lab to the waiting room, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw a man standing at the door. He was wearing an old jacket, a baseball cap, and jeans. Very normal wear for older men in this area. As I was moving from one foot to the other, I assumed he was waiting for blood work, so I turned to ask him. But when I went to face him, there was no one there. I laughed it off, assuming that I had just seen things, went to my computer, sat down and did some work. When it was time to go back into the lab and unload the centrifuge, I passed the open door and now saw the same man in the same place out of the corner of my right eye. Again, I turned and again, there was no one. At this point, I was getting a little weirded out, leaving the lab to walk back into the collection room, passing the open door. I went more slowly this time and yes, Holy crap, he was still there, now seen out of the corner of my left eye, just like the first time. While I do believe in spirits and the like, I always believe that 90% of the time there's a perfectly normal explanation for everything. There's a potted plant in my house. If you see it from the corner of your eye, it looks like there's a big shaggy dog there. We've never had a big shaggy dog, and our house was built on that land, so I know that there aren't any shaggy dog ghosts going around. It's just how your eye sees things and your brain interprets them. But at this point, I'm starting to get even more freaked out. A part of me wants to see if I can contact him, and a part of me just wants him to go away. About 10 minutes later, the other tech has returned. As she's walking from the collection room to the lab, she stops and gives me a start. She looks back at me and laughs and says, I just thought I saw an old man sitting in the chairs there. I looked at her and simply said, I've been seeing him all morning. Are you serious? She asked. Very, I said. We never saw him again, but the next day, we learned that one of our seniors had died that afternoon. I guess it was either someone who had passed and was lost, or he was waiting for the other senior. Either way, I won't be forgetting that experience for a while. pretty weird experience at the Hilton Garden Inn in Jackson, Mississippi, formerly the King Edward Hotel. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this place being haunted or had an experience there themselves. I've looked online and I can't seem to find anything. It was built in 1923, closed in 1967, vacant for almost 40 years, and reopened in 2009, but that's about it. Anyway, my partner and I stayed here a couple of nights ago, just passing through on a road trip home. My partner is not a believer in the spiritual or paranormal realm. In the morning, he woke me up at 5 a.m. wanting to leave immediately. He's been sick during our vacation, so I thought that maybe he was just feeling crappy and wanted to get an early start on the rest of our trip, so we leave. After about 30 minutes on the road, he says, I want to tell you something but I don't want to talk about it anymore after I tell you. We can talk about it later. I agree, and he tells me that something was in the room with us that night. Something, not someone. 
He said that our pup was staring right at it and wasn't barking. I got full body chills and a huge lump in my throat when he told me. It freaked me out so much because he doesn't believe in these things and he just looked beyond terrified when he told me. We haven't talked about it again yet. Does anyone else have any experiences there? So, my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hot spot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, and the baptistry, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son and part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is little more than a mild inconvenience due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel into an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell you occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had the key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person, was not at the church to witness this part. Immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I would be interested in joining them. I was. I arrived a few minutes later and went inside. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these were very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder and he sits it in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we keep hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason we decide to take the exact same path we had just taken over and over. On our second go-round is when we noticed something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on our first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, which is when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continued on this path maybe three to four more times, each time the broom had been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it's been long enough, so we go to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording, when we finally realized how stupid of an idea it was, because there was no way to tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we hear a loud tap that was coming from just a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, and then one more tap even closer. Finally, we hear a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reached the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway altogether, and two, there's a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us, and that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight in the middle of the hallway is a wet paper towel.
This is one of my many experiences at St. Thomas Church. This one was about eight years ago. Probably not that scary compared to other things that I've experienced, but it was the first one that popped into my head. I went to a graveyard that had a church with four of my friends. One of my friends knew about it, as he had come once before. The rest of us had never been. Now, my intention was to go there to see if I could genuinely talk to any spirits because of past experiences. Two of my friends, however, were the usual let's have a laugh and mock the dead type, while the other two were shitting themselves, as you do. We walked around for about 15 minutes and I was asking questions like, is anyone here that wants to talk? But it was hard with my two friends acting like idiots. So I just thought, okay, this is silly. I'll just stop. Now, just to be clear, Two of the cars we took were right next to each other, about half a meter apart, with the big gates to the right of the cars, which is where you enter straight into the graveyard. We walked back to the cars, and I leaned against one car, and one friend next to me, on my left, and the other three leaned against the other car. Now we're all facing each other, just talking, when suddenly from the right of us, we hear this voice, almost like a child's voice, say, help me. I am not kidding. My friends and I all looked right in the same direction at the same time. All of our heads just turned, and we all went silent, giving each other that look like, what's going on? I said quietly to all of them, you heard that, right? Their faces said it all. Then about 30 seconds later, we heard it again. Help me but it was a little bit fainter. My friends started to panic, and I was a little scared, but more curious. They opened their car door so fast it wasn't funny. I don't blame them. I hopped in the back of my mate's car, the one that I was leaning on, and her car wouldn't start straight away. I looked out the window, and my two mates in the other car had already sped off. I was trying to calm my friends down, who I was in the car with, but after about a minute, the car started, and my friend who was driving sped off screaming, I'm never coming back here again, while my friend in the passenger seat agreed. When we were off the road that leads to the graveyard, she slowed down, and I pulled my phone out to see if I could find anything about this graveyard, as I had never been before. I found out that there were two young twin brothers who used to play around there at the church and attend with their family. One day, they were playing and tried to play a prank. Something went wrong, and they both caught fire and burned to death. I swear that voice we heard sounded exactly like a young boy's voice. Creeped me out. I told my friends, and they agreed. They also said that they would never go back there, and I can't blame them. Personally, I've been back four times now, and something has happened every time. A few friends and I decided to book a small getaway up north for a week or so. We settled on a lovely converted church in the middle of nowhere next to a small river near the sea. After a couple hours of driving to the place, we finally arrived and were faced with this small converted old church. It was beautiful, and we were sure we were going to have a great time. We opened the door and started to settle in. There was a log stove in the corner, and with it being September in Scotland, it was kind of chilly. I made sure that it was lit consistently. We cracked open some drinks and put on some music. Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast to be exact, but we never thought of the connection to the church. So we had our drinks and a great night. I had fallen asleep on the sofa, and I woke up through the night but had this strange feeling of somebody watching me. I shrugged it off thinking that it was just because of the strange surroundings, and that I was probably just uncomfortable in a new place. The next morning I woke up and decided to do all the dishes. While I was washing up, 
My friend came through and sat on the sofa. I had a dinner plate and a side plate in my hands and turned around to put them on the counter. As I turned away, I saw the plates slide along the counter and nearly fall off. As you would expect, I grabbed them, but as I did, I felt some kind of energy push back at me. It was the weirdest feeling, kind of like being electrocuted but without the pain. I dropped the plates and stepped back in panic as my friend said, Are you okay? I just said, Yeah, I'm fine because I didn't want to seem silly. What I realized, though, after it happened, was that I was wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. Most of the things that happened seemed to happen in connection with that band or something similar. My other friend came through then and remarked how cold it was in the room, which was strange because, as I mentioned before, I had the log burner stove going all the time. Again, I said nothing. A few days passed, and on the last night, my friend was tidying up as we were all in bed. We heard footsteps upstairs, but we thought it was just him, until we realized that he was washing dishes and hadn't been upstairs all night. It was a crazy week, and some other things happened, but those were the most serious. I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there, and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. 
I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th. Our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend Elle asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in old house, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. When I was in the fourth through eighth grade, we moved into a century old farmhouse in Straw Town, Indiana. My father was in and out of the picture at this point in my life. So most of the time it was just me, my mother and two younger brothers living there. One was only a year younger than I was and the youngest was zero to four during this time. The house always felt as though somebody was watching you or breathing down your neck. I'm just going to list things that occurred for brevity's sake. 
Number one, this happened to my mom. She started seeing this black shadow around the house. She said that she could smell him, like the body odor would be smelled in a specific spot, not directly next to it. As time went on, she started seeing the imprint of somebody sitting on the edge of her bed. Then one night, it laid across her legs and she woke up thrashing trying to get it off. Number two, these things happened to me. I had the upstairs bedroom connected to the attic door through a small closet. These were huge rooms. Things were the least crazy for me. I would just hear footsteps run up and down the stairs at night when my brothers would be in bed. The scariest thing that would happen to me was that often the door to the attic would swing open as though somebody had forced it and it would hit the wall. Then a cold presence would rush to my bedside. When I was 14, I started into a spiraling depression. I painted my walls blood red and I began to write poetry and things on my walls in this really aggressive handwriting. I have never felt or acted that way since. I have, however, had many instances of paranormal activity that have followed me throughout my life. Number three, one of my brothers had a bad. I only know fragments of his story as what happened to him is something he'd rather forget. One night he was screaming in his room. We checked on him and he had been smacked across the face. We figured it was just him hitting himself in his sleep, but the handprint was upside down. It was impossible that he did it to himself. 15 years later, my mom told me that she found him crying on the stairs one night. He was reluctant to tell her why, but when pressed, he told her that he kept hearing voices, telling him to kill all of us. My mom understandably kept this from us. When I asked him about it, he was visibly upset and said that it stopped as soon as we moved from the house and he didn't want to talk about it. My youngest brother was two to three when he started saying weird stuff. He would talk about the boots walking around the house with no body attached. He'd also hear laughing whenever he would get near the basement steps. I remember the four of us kneeling and praying that this entity would leave us alone, but it didn't. We decided to leave after a morning when my mom and youngest brother were home alone. They were taking a nap. When the bed and dresser started violently shaking, there was no earthquake and no reason for it. They shook by themselves, and my mom described it as feeling as though she was being intimidated. We moved out. We were told by a neighbor that everybody that's ever moved into that house has moved out within a few months. It's empty now. I still drive by it, and I want to go confront whatever's there and get answers. The landlord is an old farmer that doesn't believe us. This has been the first time I've ever talked about it, really, at least publicly. Since I've moved on with my life, I've lived in several different houses. I've heard strange noises of objects moving in other rooms and deliberate knocking. Not super frequently though. In one house, we had a painting of delight yourself in the name of the Lord up in the dining room. We heard this crash one night and found it five feet to the right, blocking the bathroom entrance. We also could hear razors and shampoo bottles being tossed in the bathroom at that house. In another, I had two friends over playing poker in the kitchen. And as we were talking about a shelf that had come off the wall the night before, a plastic blender cup was chucked out of the pantry behind us and bounced off that exact wall. I don't know if something followed me from that house or if it's related at all, but it's been interesting.